Welcome. Uh, my name is Jake Abrimus. I am a professor at NYU Gallatin, and I am also the director of the Initiative for Critical Disaster Studies. I want to welcome you to the third and final event of our uh, semester-long lecture series that we've been calling New Ideas in Climate Change and Critical Disaster Studies. It's the inaugural series of events for the initiative, uh, and I hope that you will um, come back in the fall for uh, more programming uh, to be to be announced, uh, hopefully in person uh, next um, next fall. Uh, it has been such a pleasure to have folks come um, uh, to to events by Zoom. I know that Zoom has we have we are all over Zoomed and all uh, over screened this uh, this spring. Um, and it has been a real pleasure, though, to be able to use the, the kind of the excuse of Zooming to bring in people from uh, around the country and indeed around the continent for this event. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, uh, I just want to thank folks. I want to thank uh, Suzanne Wofford and Mary Parnay uh, for their support of the initiative, for their uh, support of this uh, series of events. And especially, I want to thank the people who uh, have made it possible uh, in the special events office, Mike West and Teresa Anderson, uh, with whom, uh, without whom, uh, I would not have been able to do any of this. And of course, Jennifer Burge, our stage manager, who does all of the uh, technological work to make any of this possible, um, without whom, I think this whole school would have fallen apart in the last year. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mike and Teresa and uh, Jen. Um, so now um, I want to uh, introduce our third and final series in the speaker. Uh, Richard McKinley Mizell Jr. is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies uh, of History at the University of Houston. Uh, his research, and I'm going to say this and it's not going to be exactly clear why he's here, his research focuses on healthcare politics, medical citizenship, environmentalism and health, medical technology, and the transformation of disease identity. But he is also um, a, a leading scholar in uh, the history and actually both the, the present of, of disaster and particularly of floods. Uh, he is the author of, of this book, Blackwater Blues, the Mississippi Flood of 1927 in the African-American Imagination. Uh, I was saying to him before we started how rare it is that I get to read a book that says in its kind of bibliographic information includes discography. Um, it's a it's a cultural history of uh, the 1927 flood, which I think is for for many of us kind of a forgotten event, but which was really a, a signal event in um, in the history of the 20th century United States uh, for for a large number of reasons, and really um, has these kind of uh, maybe hidden or maybe not uh, kind of after effects in American life and culture, um, and which we'll hear about today. And he's also uh, the co-editor of Resilience and Opportunity, Lessons from the US Gulf Coast after Katrina and Rita. He's published in a wide range of academic and public venues, uh, Journal of African American History, ISIS, Open Rivers, American Historian, um, and his work has been um, quoted and cited in a large number of popular uh, press um, venues. Uh, he's, he's currently um, back in medical history uh, where he is writing a history of race and diabetes in the 20th century and co-editing the Oxford Handbook of American Medical History. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear his discussion of um, 1927 and the American century. Uh, so with that, um, Richard Mazel, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Appreciate that introduction. Let me share my screen here. Um, you really foreshadowed um, a bit of my presentation quite nicely. So, so thank you. I want to thank you again for the for the wonderful invitation and the NYU Gallatin School 
um, for this invitation. And I want to thank everyone out there for attending, you know, so late in the semester. Um, as Jacob said, we're, we're all zoomed out um, at this point and then over the last year and definitely by this semester. Um, I am a historian of race, environment, technology, and health. Uh, my research um, intersects those, those different fields. And so part of what I will present to you today um, deals a little bit with, mostly with environmental um, aspects of my research and training, but also a little bit of, of how I'm thinking about questions of health and, and public health, particularly around diabetes. And um, as Jacob mentioned, I am writing a history of race and diabetes um, at this moment. Um, but my research, again, is, is always at the intersection. It's always at the cross of these you know, various overlapping um, questions of environmentalism, race, um, medicine, and technology. Um, my first book, um, Backwater Blues, the Mississippi Flood of 1927 in the African-American Imagination, um, highlighted the importance of the 1927 flood. Um, the 1927 flood, of course, was the result of a significant amount of rain in the Mississippi Valley Basin um, uh, in the, by late 1926 um, and early 1927. The river um, was flooded from um, essentially Cairo, Illinois, all the way through the Gulf of Mexico, flooding seven states and 1,100 square miles from Cairo, Illinois, to New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico, shattering and destroying levees up and down the Mississippi River and throughout the Mississippi Valley and its tributaries. It would lead to a significant piece of legislation, one of the most significant pieces of legislation in environmental history, and that was, of course, the 1928 Flood Control Act, which um, shored up and um, sort of rebuilt in some ways many of the levees and, and sort of flood control structures um, in the Mississippi Valley, um, but also as far away as, as California as well. But part of what I talk about in this book is that the 1927 flood was a, a double disaster. It was not only a, a flood, an epic flood, but it was also a disaster of, of race and racism and anti-Black um, violence towards um, mostly sharecroppers, but other African-Americans within the, the region as well. Um, well known by now, um, National Guardsmen um, guarded African Americans in these levy camps, which were called concentration camps, um, by force, by, by gun, and did not allow the movement in and out of these camps. Um, African Americans or Blacks had to have a pass to move in, in and out of these camps for food. Um, many of them were, particularly the men, but also the women were conscripted into forced labor. And much of this was described by, by Richard Wright um, in his flood blues, uh, in his flood literature, uh, particularly the, down by the riverside and the man who saw the flood. I make the argument in, in my book that in some ways, this, these were the first moments of sort of primary source documents that we have of the flood, um, a point that I'll come back to um, in a moment. But my book also deals with um, the flood as commemorated through blues music. Um, the 1927 flood was in many ways the first disaster that popular musicians, blues musicians, signified and, and talked through and evaluated and um, sort of positioned themselves visa this particular storm. Uh, many of them were from the Mississippi Delta and had migrated to Chicago, to Los Angeles. Um, but even for those who were not, um, you know, particularly uh, versed in the Mississippi River, or, or should I say, um, were not from the Mississippi River, um, the stories that were coming out of the Mississippi Valley region and those states flooded by the storm uh, made their way into popular consciousness and therefore into this broader popular imagination of the blues. And so this was um, a fundamental aspect of, of the arguments that I was making in this particular book. And so this talk today talks about what we sort of take from these moments, this moment of the 1927 flood and how we apply it to um, a select number of, of, of other disasters later in the century. 
a couple of years ago, and you know, I'm always sort of rethinking time now that you know you have to think about pandemic time. Um, I, I keep thinking it was a year ago, but in actuality, it was about two years ago. Um, I did an NPR interview on the 1927 flood, and the person, um, Lane Kaplan um, Leverson, asked me a, an interesting question, um, which Jacob actually sort of brought up in his introduction, which was. Why was the 1927 flood not remembered? Um, why has it not been um, commemorated like other disasters? And I thought that was a very interesting question and, and not a particularly easy question to, to answer in some ways, but, but part of it has to do with the fact that the 1927 flood was in many ways a, a broad disaster. It was a slow moving disaster. It wasn't something that occurred over the course of a day or two days. It occurred slowly methodically over the course of weeks and months from, again, the, the late fall of 1926 through the summer of 1927. Um, it's hard to also pinpoint a particular place like you can with other disasters. Um, Chinatown, for example, um, with the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which was um, leveled. Um, you, you see, of course, when you visit San Francisco, uh, commemoration of the of the earthquake in Chinatown, in San Francisco's Chinatown, or here in Texas, Galveston, um, the port uh, or the ocean side, um, which was leveled by the 1900 hurricane. Now, um, it is not as easy to to pinpoint those particular kinds of places um, for the 1927 flood. Um, but the lessons are, are still there, and it's within the breadth and, and the multi-generational aspect of, of the 1927 flood that's most telling and so important for me for thinking about the future of disasters. The 1927 flood signals so much of what would become points of contention around race and disasters later in the century. The 1927 flood um, did not begin in many ways in 1926, but much earlier, um, as early as the late 19th or mid 19th century, with um, the, the use of levees and construction of levees to unnecessarily confine the Mississippi River, but also these questions of race and racism and the sharecropping system and violence and Jim Crow um, in the Mississippi region. So that's part of how we can then think about these, these broader questions of, of where the 1927 flood can, can take us. In addition to my interest in the 1927 flood, I have also very much been interested in this um, storm of, of Princeville. And, and in actuality, they were back-to-back -back hurricanes, which occurred in Princeville, North Carolina in 1999. And I have a personal interest in this because I grew up um, about an hour west of Princeville, North Carolina. Um, I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, much of my family is um, from the eastern part of North Carolina, a little bit east of, of, North, of, of Princeville, North Carolina. And so this, this storm hit home for me. And when given the opportunity to write about it for um, a, uh, an online journal, um, I jumped at the opportunity because there was so much richness and, and sort of texture to this story. And it connected for me, um, these broader conversations around the 1927 flood and um, Hurricane Katrina. So I wanna spend a little bit of time um, talking about Princeville and, and a little bit about how it connects to, to what we might think about the, uh, the 1927 flood and moving forward. Princeville was, was founded by formerly enslaved African-Americans in 1865 as Freedom Hill and incorporated in 1885 as Princeville in honor, of one of, in, honor of one of, in honor of one of its earliest and most radical advocates, Richard Turner Prince. Princeville residents, most of them direct descendants of Freedom Hill's founders, continue to have a powerful place-based connection to the town. Early Princeville residents had to endure harsh swamplands to survive. Their existence in this space was not a matter of chance or choice, but instead the discarded and unwanted space was what former slaveholders allowed them to occupy. Like other towns in the River Basin, Princeville, Princeville's legacy is one of perseverance and endurance against the constant threat of seasonal flooding. But Princeville had more to persevere against than seasonal flooding. 
The mere presence and economic self-sufficiency and stability of an all black town during the segregated Jim Crow South was an affront to segregationists. Put in more stark terms, Princeville infuriated segregationists who opposed any type of self-sufficiency and power among black people. The early years of Freedom Hill and Princeville were extremely difficult because of the landscape of place and the landscape of race. The Tar River, Pamlico River is legendary in North Carolina. Now this, the Tar River, Pamlico, um, when I grew up, it, we called it the Tar. Um, I guess the official name is the Tar Pamlico, um, but we knew it as the Tar River or, or the Mighty Tar. And as my father says all the time, um, the Tar River kept our family and many other families from literally starving to death because of the, uh, because of the plentiful fish population um, when he was a boy. Um, but the Tar River can also bring destruction. Um, the Tar is a, is a dangerous river. It is a muddy, low-lying river, um, lots of branches, um, lots of water moccasins. Um, it's one of those rivers where um, one step could be five feet and the next step could be 30. Um, so every year, even to this day, you hear of people um, drowning in, in the Tar River. Um, during the era of segregation, um, when African Americans were not allowed to, to swim in the municipal swimming pools, um, they would swim in the Tar River, always fearful of the dangerous nature of this particular river. Its, heads, its headwaters begin in, in the Piedmont region of the state and slowly meanders through the eastern coastal part of the state, ultimately spilling into the Atlantic Ocean. Approximately 180 miles long, the Tar River Basin is the fourth largest in the state and one of only four rivers whose boundaries are located completely inside the state of North Carolina. The Tar is a slow moving body of water, low lying, marshy, historically susceptible to flooding and overflows. Documented floods of the Tar River occurred in 1800, 1865, 1889, 1919, 1924, 1940, and 1958. Today, the eastern part of North Carolina is the poorest region in the state. The median family income for Edgecombe County, where Princeville is located, is just $34,000 per year. The rate of individuals living below the poverty line is over 55,000, uh, living below the poverty line in a, in a county of over 55,000 residents is almost 23%, roughly 8% higher than the statewide average. The 41 counties that make up the eastern portion of the state have a higher morbidity and mortality disease rate than the rest, than the rest of the state. Diabetes has skyrocketed in the last three decades, as have hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. This was the backdrop in 1999 when back-to-back -back hurricanes occurred. In early September 1999, Hurricane Dennis struck the coast of North Carolina, bringing winds of just over 70 miles per hour and six to eight inches of rain. Just 10 days later, another hurricane, Hurricane Floyd, would hit the coast, bringing significantly higher winds of 130 miles per hour. Floyd was a broad, a broad storm with a wingspan of 580 miles that liberally spread rainfall and high winds up and down the East Coast, including an additional 12 to 15 inches on the coast of North Carolina. The Tar River, Pamlico River, Noose River, Roanoke River, and other smaller creeks and streams began flooding from the rainfall of Floyd, pushing floodwaters onto the rich farmland of Eastern North Carolina. Princeville was underwater for 11 days. Thousands of Eastern North, Carolina's, North Carolinians lived for years in what were called FEMA fields, which would sound familiar to many of us now. This compilation of makeshift trailers, nicknamed Camp Depression by some residents, was located outside of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, near a landfill. Using Princeville's history and the unforgotten history of environmental activism against toxic, toxic materials dumped in Warren County, North Carolina, just two decades earlier, Princeville residents once again found themselves in a continuum of poor people and minorities being forced into degraded spaces. <clears throat> 
In many ways, Princeville was a powerful yet unacknowledged precursor to Hurricane Katrina six years later. Many of the frustrations with the Federal Emergency Management Agency were registered by both Princeville and Katrina survi survivors, particularly in terms of how long it took the organization to provide relief. In a 2014 report on Princeville, current and former residents believed that relief from FEMA was slow, echoing, echoing similar criticisms of FEMA after Katrina. The report also acknowledged the strong historical ties a place that both Princeville and New Orleans residents voiced after being displaced from their homes. But there is another part of this story. In the weeks after Floyd, rumors began circulating that perhaps the suffering of Princeville was not completely the result of the storm. Soon the rumors were confirmed. The city of Rocky Mount, located roughly 16 miles to the west of Princeville along I-64, opened the floodgates to the Tar River Reservoir Dam during the first days of the storm in the hopes of averting disaster. The Tar River Reservoir was completed in 1971 as a drinking water conservation project primarily for the city of Rocky Mount, which had been suffering severe droughts in recent years. The decision and actions of Rocky Mount seem to have occurred very quickly during the first 48 hours of Hurricane Floyd as the Tar Reservoir was threatening to flood. In an interview with UNC TV, Peter Varney, the assistant manager for Rocky Mount, suggested that the city was, quote, wrapped up in an unbelievable flood of decisions, problems, and issues. We just went ahead and dropped that gate. It appeared to us, he said, that what would, be, what would come by lowering the gate by two feet would not be noticeable, end quote. State officials argued that Rocky Mount's actions were acceptable under, under the circumstances and made the point that opening the floodgate likely did not increase the level of downstream flooding to a significant degree. However, it has never been confirmed how much water was actually sent downstream by Rocky Mount's actions. The moral and ethical tension of the situation also revolved around whether Rocky Mount was required to or should have informed their downstream neighbors of their impending action. The perception of Black, of African-Americans in the Eastern part of the state was that the waterfront property of Princeville and the lives of Princeville residents were much less valuable than those of Rocky Mount to North Carolina officials. Decisions are not made within a vacuum, but importantly can be linked through history to questions of worthy and unworthy sufferers. Freedom Hill survived a difficult landscape in the immediate period after the Civil War. Princeville residents have been fighting all kinds of difficult landscapes along the mighty tar ever since. 17 years later, um, Hurricane Matthew would again strike the town of Princeville, forcing residents to assess um, once again whether to relocate whether to sell their properties or to rebuild. Um, this um, piece in the New York Times, um, which was published in 19, I'm sorry, 2016, um, highlighted um, the, uh, the frustration that many Princeville res residents had over this prospect of having to give up their land with their connection to their ancestors once again. Um, some pushed for um, the relocation of the entire town or certain parts of the town. Um, others pushed for uh, an elevation of certain parts of the town, but these are um, uh, conversations that are continuing to, 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 to come to fruition even today, as many of these residents constantly uh, fret over uh, the, the facing of yet another storm every year during hurricane season. So these questions are, are constantly on the minds of Princeville residents, but also um, other residents in other towns as well. And for Princeville, um, this connection to place, but also the long history of race, what happened in 1919 with the belief that they were um, um, sacrificed for the betterment of a town, of course, spoke to sort of questions of this occurring during the 1927 Mississippi River flood. Um, when New Orleans and other areas outside of the city um, deliberately sacrificed um, Plaquemines and St. Bernard's Parish to save the city from the 1927 flood. 
Um, there were also, of course, rumors um, during Hurricane Betsy in 1965 that certain parts of New Orleans was being sacrificed for the betterment of um, the uh, residents and communities on the higher ground. And of course, if you recall, these were sort of similar conversations had around um, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. So again, it's a continuum. Um, these things do not happen in a vacuum. And these are the types of experiences, um, interactions with both race and place um, that many people have. Um, Jelani Cobb uh, wrote also about some of these issues in a, um, a very nice piece in the New Yorker called Race in the Storm um, in August 16, um, in, in 2015. And talking mostly about Hurricane Katrina, um, he highlighted what, what myself and, and many others have talked about, which is the double burden of, of race and environmentalism, sort of highlighting how the 1927 flood was not just an environmental disaster, but a social disaster. Um, that disasters must be framed within a much longer trajectory of race, class, and gender, and highlighted that um, sort of the idea of a natural disaster was such that we needed to complicate that question and really think about the social, cultural, and political aspects of disasters. Um, he makes the point, importantly, that um, the 2010 Haiti earthquake um, was significantly weaker than the earthquake off the coast of Japan in 2011. Um, Haiti resulted in roughly 15 times the rate of casualties um, than Japan's earthquake. Um, a point that Cobb accurately suggests was the result of the vastly different economic and geopolitical standings of the two nations. And this included, of course, differences in the quality of housing. I would add that there was a significant difference in the amount of aid coming from various nations, governments, and states around the world as well. So thinking about Princeville and the 1927 flood, much of my work has also revolved around this question of disasters and disasters in the archive. Um, this American historian piece, which Jacob Reams actually has a very good piece on disasters in the progressive era, um, was my way in some ways of thinking about some of these broader questions and issues within the disaster archive. Um, the absences within um, the archives, which makes it difficult for um, historians to, to write about some of these issues and questions. Um, disaster historians, we, we love the, the, the texture of disasters, the materiality of, 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 of a particular disaster. Um, what were people doing um, when a disaster struck? Um, what did the flood water smell like? Um, what did family, how did family react when they first understood that danger was imminent? Um, how did the ground shake, right? These are how we write about these particular disasters. Um, but when it comes to, to African-Americans and other minorities, these, these resources are, are limited. And people often ask me how I became interested in, in, in working on disasters. And, and that's a, it's a long history, but one of the reasons I became interested in, in this type of history is that my grandmother, my, my mother's mother, was actually a survivor of the 1944 Hartford Ringling Brothers Circus in um, Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we called her her grandma Dot. And she, my that side of the family is from Florida. And she accompanied as a teenager, a white family to Connecticut. And for reasons that are unknown, she took the two children to the circus by herself. And not long after the lions um, ceased performing, there was a streak of fire going up the side of the tent. And in a few seconds, the entire top of the tent was engulfed in flames. And uh, people began to, to rush the exits. Many could not get out of the exits. And the story that um, we were told is that my grandmother did not go towards the exits, but instead began to dig underneath the tent and saved herself and um, those two um, children that she was in care of. It is one of the biggest regrets of my life that I did not ask her about this and, and document and, and record you know, her story. 
Um, she died maybe a year after I graduated from college and was just becoming interested in, 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 in disasters and, 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 uh, and other types of, of history. But there was so much I, I would have, have asked her, you know, what it smelled like. Um, you know, what did she think when, 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 when the flames first, um, you know, moved up the side of the tent? How did she escape? Um, what did the family say to her uh, for saving their kids? Did they give her anything or did they just take their kids back and, and, and not say anything? Right? These are questions that, uh, that historians um, can make such good use of. Um, and it's an important part of my, of my own family's history, but also the reason why I'm doing some of the things that I'm doing. Um, but I've also become very much interested in this sort of idea of death counts, right? So I, I've argued in, in my book and other places that the, the death count of the 1927 flood was far too low, that um, the Americans who might have died at the Mound Bayou crevice in particular were never counted. And um, you can make similar arguments from disasters throughout history um, and also this Hartford uh, Ringling Brothers Circus fire. Um, the official death count likely did not take into consideration um, the transient population which frequented uh, these types of events, um, African-Americans, um, other minorities who might have been in, this, in the tent. Um, there was evidence of people who were essentially, you know, evaporated because of the flames, um, people who did not have family members and, and did not um, have someone coming to look for them. So I've, I've made um, a part of my narrative, um, thinking about this question of, of archives and, and disasters and how we think about these particular questions. And I have to give credit to one of my colleagues at Florida State, you know, when I was first writing this book, um, on the 1927 flood, and I was uh, in, in effect complaining about the difficulty finding, you know, sources, firsthand sources for the 1927 flood. Um, he suggested to me that I make that part of the argument, that I make um, the ideological archive part of my discussion. Um, archives don't just exist. Um, archives are ide ideological, ideological constructions of the time and place in which they're constructed. There are plenty of um, oral histories of the 1927 flood, but when those interviews were conducted, um, whoever was conducting them did not see the value in including Black voices. And therefore, historians have, um, do, do not have the benefit of these particular types of sources. And so I make that point, and I build on that point in, in my other research, because that is an important part of thinking about um, these broader questions of how to write and how to think about the historical past. My work has also revolved around um, public health and, and disasters. Um, you know, one of the ways that I think about Hurricane Katrina um, was the public health response to it. Um, what people were doing on dialysis, um, how people with diabetes coped with evacuating from the storm. And so this particular piece, um, which I wrote as part of a round table um, for the journal ISIS, sort of highlights you know, some of these broader questions and issues that, that were emanating from um, Hurricane Katrina and thinking about the special needs um, populations. Um, Hurricane Katrina pulled back the curtain on an epidemic of lost limbs, failed kidneys and diabetic bodies that had long plagued New Orleans. That is to say a public health disaster was unfolding long before the hurricane struck. The arrival of the storm brought to our collective attention the unacknowledged pain and suffering diabetics in New Orleans and the region had experienced for decades. Now, part of what I was interested in um, for this particular piece were disruptions in food supplies. Um, which were a unique uh, issue for, for diabetics, especially diabetic evacuees who were uh, managed, who were responsible for self-managing their disease. Um, diabetics are in many ways different from, from other individuals suffering from chronic disease, including cancer, in the sense that they have to do a certain amount of self-managing, um, self-actualization self and surveillance of their own bodies. Um, pricking themselves, managing their A1C levels, um, managing their glucose levels. All of these things, you know, historically, um, diabetics have had to do uh, 
um, since the, at least the early part of the 20th century, if not before. So what happens when you're evacuated to a health, to a shelter uh, because of a storm and the foods that are coming in are not diabetic friendly? Um, this means that there has to be sort of forethought and planning and resiliency to deal with this special needs population. Diabetics were, were forced to consume foods that were high in salt, high in sugar, um, were of a processed nature, um, high in salt, making it difficult for them to manage their A1C levels, cholesterol, and blood pressure levels. The inability of these shelters to refrigerate insulin um, also made it difficult for evacuees. Um, many of these um, evacuees brought whatever insulin they could with them, um, but may have run out in the days and weeks after being evacuated to a particular shelter. Um, they were unable to, to manage their, their diabetes through insulin injection. Um, they were unable to have the supplies to, to stick themselves, to, to insert insulin um, at the appropriate times. Um, there, were, there was a lack of, sort of glucose monitors, syringes, again, refrigerators. All of these issues um, were part of, of what I talked about in this particular piece, um, but also comes up in other disasters and storms as well. In our sort of uh, narrative of Hurricane Katrina, we have not, I think, talked enough about certain special needs populations. Um, in this sense, um, in, in particular, diabetics. Um, there are, um, quite frankly, painful stories of immobile and frail diabetics evacuating um, during the storm. Um, complications of, of amputated limbs, swollen feet, dialysis, blindness, compromised cardiovascular health, um, hindered evacuation at every turn. Skin abrasions, um, common for some diabetics, um, could result in serious infection when forced to wade through filthy, toxic floodwaters. Um, diabetics have to take care of their skin. So I just want you to imagine for a moment um, having a skin break, which could lead to an infection and having to walk and wade through this water, which was filled with um, oil from, from, from decomposed bodies, from decomposed plants and animals, and what that might do to someone who is suffering from diabetes. Among this group, the elderly um, who lacked private health insurance made up a significant proportion of those who showed up in emergency rooms and hospitals post Katrina. The trauma also revealed a formerly invisible population of diabetics newly diagnosed in emergency clinics and evacuation shelters, whose conditions had been either neglected or ignored until the storm created a medical crisis of awareness. In the years following Katrina, commentators anticipated that the storm might lead to a new war on poverty and a wide ranging conversation on racial discrimination in American society. Researchers, policymakers, and citizens expressed enthusiasm for rebuilding the nation's infrastructure and building resilient communities that could better prepare for earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, and other disasters. The momentum, however, did not last. As a nation, the United States has a short collective memory. Throughout the world, researchers have long known of a link between disasters and increased diabetic comorbidities. And this is a point where this short attention span um, can, can rear its ugly head. There were elevated risk factors and ER visits among diabetics after Tropical Storm Iniki um, in 1992, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, Hurricane Maryland in 2004, and Hurricane Charlie in 2004. Not just hurricanes, but also um, other forms of um, disasters. Um, there were increased ER visits um, among diabetics after the Kashmir province earthquake in 2005, Chicago heat wave in 2005, and Southern California heat wave in 2006. As I was writing this piece a couple of years ago now, um, in my immediate 
mind was uh, the fact that the country was recently had recently gone through um, the, the government shutdown. And so I, whenever there's an event like this, I, I think about diabetics and, and what they're going through and what individuals who have a sudden disruption in their daily lives um, and income, how that can lead to increased diabetic complications and emergency room visits. Here, this image um, of um, some individuals who were um, uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, um, Mary Hatcher um, lies on a cot in the Superdome feeling ill. Um, Hatcher, who was a diabetic, lost her medication in, in the New Orleans floodwaters and now awaits uh, medicine for evacuation. Um, supplies would arrive and for some shelters, but much of that was, you know, weeks and sometimes months after um, people were first evacuated. Um, the top, um, Caesar Martin, 20, a diabetic, um, is massaged um, after waiting for, for weeks and months in a New Orleans um, evacuation shelter. So a lot of my research also uh, my thinking revolves around what happens when disasters collide. Um, as you might imagine, as a historian of medicine, I've been brought into a lot of conversations around um, the SARS coronavirus 2 um, virus um, and thinking about questions of race and health. Um, I've been writing pieces about um, diabetes and, and COVID and how diabetics are suffer disproportionately because of the pandemic. Um, not only questions of you know lack of access to to jobs and income and and inability to to exercise in ways that are conducive to managing diabetes, um, but also you know what questions of obesity means. Um, diabetic diabetes uh, wreaks havoc on your immune system, and so when you have a weakened immune system, obesity causes a, a sort of constant inflammatory status. Um, which makes you vulnerable to, to not just the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but, but other um, viruses and, and illnesses as well. Um, type 1, at least, um, and, and sort of in part type 2, um, is an autoimmune disease, which means that you are increasingly susceptible to, um, um, to viruses and stress within the body. And the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic brings stress within the body in, in a number of ways. But you know, as I close, I'm, I sort of push us to think about these questions of you know, what happens when disasters collide. About a year ago, in, in ways that were uh, imperceptible to many of us because we were um, you know, still trying to wrap our minds around what this pandemic meant, there was an earthquake in Zagreb, Croatia um, in March 2020 that some of you might remember. Um, it did not, it, it resulted in a few deaths, um, significantly more injuries, but, but also fairly widespread damage in certain parts of, of the region. And I remember following this particular disaster and, and one woman's words uh, really stuck out to me, which was, you know, when the world started shaking, she, she said, well, I have to get out first and then find a, a mask later. Um, which shows, you know, in some ways what happens when, you know, these disasters collide. Um, you have to try and save your life, but you can't forget that there is still a, a deadly pandemic out there that we need to plan for. And this collision of disasters um, is likely to occur again, especially as researchers and scientists um, say that our current pandemic is, is, is in many ways not the big one, that there is an even bigger pandemic um, on the horizons that will come, which means that we have to constantly and continue to think about these questions of, of, of sort of pandemics and environmental disasters and what you know many scholars have called foreseeable disasters. Um, I think of you know Eric Klinenberg's you know wonderful work on on heat waves, um, heat waves, a social autopsy of disaster in Chicago. Um, and the multiple overlapping disasters that he talks about, um, very powerful um, um, book, um, in my opinion, particularly when he talks about um, elderly populations um, living in high rises in Chicago, 
um, where many of those individuals who died um, were um, elderly and had outlived their social networks and no one was checking on them. The city um, did not have a plan for dealing with the elderly during this particular disaster. Many of them had chronic conditions and would had to make a decision or a choice, which was to either run their air conditioner or pay their rent. And many chose to, to pay their rent and did not run their air conditioner and died in, in hot boxes um, in their um, high rise apartments. And for some of them, the only re reason that they were discovered was one, their rent was due, or two, their bodies began to decompose and neighbors started to complain. So these questions of, of, of sort of foreseeable disasters are with us because we are going to have heat waves and we're going to have sort of chronic conditions and pandemics that we have to think about in the future. Every summer seems to bring um, forest fires in, in California and Arizona and other parts of the country. Last summer, if you recall, they were unable to, to fight these forest fires in ways that they were normally able to because of the pandemic. Um, normally, they bring um, firefighters from all over the country, if not to the world, to a particular region. Um, they put them up in, in shelters, you know, bunched together. They put them on buses and, and helicopters and fly them to the region. Um, that was difficult to do last summer because of, of the pandemic. And this necessitates, uh, again, um, a certain amount of planning and resiliency for this type of work. And also winter storms, um, bad winter um, in certain parts of the country. Of course, here in, in, in Texas, we had the, the disaster um, which um, killed uh, numerous people, um, which was in many ways preventable. Um, but these issues, um, which we can sort of tie to, to questions of climate change, um, will continue to occur, which will continue to make the most vulnerable among us uh, susceptible to, to these types of disasters. And then with overlapping vulnerabilities of chronic disease and pandemicity and questions of long-term chronic disease and illness. So these issues, I would argue in, in conclusion, are, are not going anywhere. And we have to continue to think about these issues and questions and plan and, and make choices that are um, sort of usable to a, to a certain population, to, to groups of people um, who are most in need and, and, and most vulnerable to, to both uh, chronic disease as well as, as, as environmental disasters as well. I was giving a talk a couple of days ago, and I said that I am at this point in my career, clearly um, you know, mid-career, um, and I've sort of made some changes to how I think about my, my research, which is to say that um, I, I'm more outward facing in terms of you know, making policy suggestions and, and sort of looking for ways to, to think about how my research can uh, influence people's lives um, on the ground. And I've done so with um, sort of more advocacy around generic um, insulin, affordability of insulin, and I'm starting to do so, starting to do so um, around these questions of environmental inequities as well. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time and I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Rick. That was a uh, fantastic talk. Uh, I, I know that we are all uh, quietly applauding in our own homes and offices. I want to invite uh, the folks in the audience to um, ask questions. What we're going to do is ask you to raise your hand, and we will um, ask you then to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly, as opposed to um, putting it in the chat or, or uh, in the question and answer section. Uh, but I'm going to take kind of my chair's prerogative and, and start with a question. Um, and actually kind of bring together the, the last two things that you said, which was I, I'm really, I was really struck by in both the Zagreb example and in the uh, heat wave example, the way not only do these two, um, these two disasters, heat, um, earthquake, COVID, um, poverty and social isolation and heat wave uh, intersect and deepen each other, but they also cause, um, they also conflict with each other, right? The people's response uh, that they have to choose, which disaster do I deal with 
right now? Do I do I escape the earthquake, the the falling down building without a mask? Uh, deal with the earthquake first. Do I do I risk eviction in order to turn on the air conditioning? Uh, and so I and then at the very end, you kind of teased us and said that you are um, moving from just historical analysis and and narration to talking more about policy and and contemporary kind of solutions one might one might think um, and so I wanted to kind of ask you how you thought about these these issues when responding on the individual level or perhaps also at the social level uh, responding to one disaster ne necessarily kind of where there has to be a choice and how do we build policy or what policy can you imagine that helps us to uh, escape that those those um, those choices or those problems? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know one thing I didn't point out was you know in that image of, of Zagreb in Croatia, you know, you see the destruction in the background, but you you know see the people with with the mask as well, which sort of uh, sort of in a material way sort of sort of highlights the the dual disaster of the destruction of the, the, the environmental world, but also the, the destruction of, of the, the current pandemic. But, I, you know, I, I think that these, these questions are, are, are difficult, um, but they are sort of necessary for us to, to really think about um, sort of policy level uh, distinctions and, and how, you know, much of what we, um, you know, much of our environmental planning is is really rooted in the personal. And, and I think that that is the problem. I, I think that when I have these conversations around you know, evacuation, it's striking to me how so much of evacuation uh, planning is still about getting in your individual car and driving away to somewhere safe, right? Um, and I, I think that for some people in, in our society, um, there are you still might have to make a choice um, about what is you know necessary in, in this particularly immediate moment um, in the course of that woman you know she had to get out of the building but she also had to recognize that you know there was the danger of the pandemic as well but some people are better able situated um, for a number of reasons to deal with you know competing disasters not to say that it's easy but um, if you're able to, to distance yourselves and, and you're able to, to you know, manage your particular environment in a certain way, um, you know, that's one thing. But if you have you know, overlapping chronic conditions and you have to you know, go work in the supermarket, then you know, those kinds of issues are, are difficult. You cannot choose in many ways which disaster is, is the most important because you have to, you know, you have to survive. And surviving means going to work, um, but, but, but also surviving the pandemic. And at, at that particular moment for certain groups of people, um, that choice is not clear. And, and, and that's, part of, that's part of my broader work because you know, there's this sort of nagging question that we all have, which is, you know, when does a pandemic end? For some of us, it will, for some people it will be, you know, when a vaccine, you know, makes its way to herd immunity, or there is a therapeutic agent that takes, um, um, you know, some of the, the the sting out of this particular pandemic. But for other people who are suffering from chronic disease and chronic illness, um, the, the, the pandemic is sort of a continuum, right? So there was no clear beginning to the pandemic, and there's no clear end to the pandemic. And so they constantly have to make choices, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, monthly, yearly, about how to survive. So on the policy level, if we can figure out ways to make insulin affordable, figure out ways to make, um, give people a living wage, figure out ways to, to think about um, resiliency and, and the protection of certain groups and certain populations, um, I think that that would go a long way in, in thinking about how we can protect the, the most vulnerable among us. That's a, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, Sam Freeman, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and then ask your question? Yeah, lovely talk. Um, I'm thinking about the parallels between people with diabetes and people who are 
an antiretroviral therapy for HIV or methadone for drug use. And, you know, a lot of the research about COVID has been, or for that matter, about how do you survive after some of the mass destruction after the election in Kenya a few years back and all those people who had to have antiretroviral therapy. You know, clearly social networks become very important there over how people survive. Um, but the other question I have is thinking about the COVID disaster and its interaction with the kind of chronic disaster of police killings of black people and how that led not to the individual solution, but at least to some extent in mass rebellions. Um, and of course, there's also the Nicaraguan case where the earthquake led to a revolution um, back in the 1970s. So that I guess the question I'm asking you is how does you know, what determines when these things lead to a plethora of individual solutions or non-solutions and deaths versus mass action? And how does that affect, for that matter, our thinking about how to change things? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I've been thinking quite a bit about, again, as I, um, in, in the previous question about what, what some scholars have called pandemicity, which was, um, the, the fact that there's, there was not a clear beginning and end for, for the disaster. And in talking about, um, you know, HIV AIDS in certain parts of the globe, um, sort of cancer in certain parts of the globe, there was um, a, continuing, a continuing pain and suffering um, from one generation to the next. Um, and, and then sort of including sort of the more recent pandemic and, and to this particular point. Um, and I think that that is, is a point that um, is, is important because it, it ties into so many different questions um, of the historical past. I'm sort of thinking about a piece um, recently talking about um, um, certain groups of people in Africa having to, to bury um, you know, dead family members in the aftermath of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1990s um, and, and unmarked graves. Um, but also having to, to bury family members, you know, decades later in the aftermath of the, the COVID, um, uh, for people who died because of, of the COVID disaster. And, and what that means in terms of memory, um, in terms of um, sort of broader imagination. I think, um, you know, this, this sort of question of, of, of disasters and um, uh, sort of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the pandemic is, is important because, you know, it, it gets back to Jacob's question, which is that, you know, when it comes to the police killing and, and killing of, of, of Black people in this country, um, many people did not want to, to be out in the streets, but they really felt like they had no choice, that if the pandemic didn't kill them, then, then maybe the police would. And, and so at some point, presumably the pandemic will be over, but we'll still have to deal with this issue of, of the police killing us. And so having to deal with, you know, would I, will I individually vaccinate myself? Um, will I push for family members to, to become vaccinated? Um, am I advocate for um, sort of the federal government and the infrastructure of dealing with this particular pandemic? but also having to address police brutality and inequality and anti-Black racism and, and punitiveness. Um, all of these are, again, um, you make a good point, Sam, overlapping disasters um, that must be addressed on the individual level, but also must be addressed on the broader structural level as well. And um, uh, people took precautions as, as much as they could, but you know, similar uh, to ways in which people had to, to go and work um, at a grocery store because of the pandemic. Um, people also had to be out in the streets, you know, even in the midst of the pandemic, because it was life or death. Um, and it continues to be life and death, even up to this very week. 
And so these, the, these questions of, of how to, to think about um, sort of the individual and the collective are, are important um, because, you know, for many African-Americans, you know, it, we cannot have an, an individual philosophy when it comes to this because we are sort of rooted in the whole. Um, the killing of, of one black person by the police endangers all of us. And so while we might individually not want to go out into the streets, uh, many people were compelled to do so because of the need to protect all of us in the midst of this epidemic of violence, but also epidemic of, of, of health as well. So any other, any other questions? Uh, Rachel Bunker, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for the for the talk. What a wonderful way to spend a Friday afternoon. Um, I was really interested in your kind of, I mean, we've kind of talked about it a bunch now in the Q&A, but um, in the beginning of the talk, um, you had said that, you know, the name, one of the reasons why the 1927 flood isn't remembered um, is because there's no way to pinpoint a specific place um, or a specific kind of moment of disaster, that it's a slow moving disaster. And I wondered if you could just speak a little bit more about how your work and your research helps us rethink different kind of temporal trajectories of, of American history or helps us think about um, disaster and temporality in different ways. Um, do we need to always be thinking about kind of multiple temporalities or are there kind of other ways that you're thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. And I, and I, I mean, that's a, when the NPR person asked me that question, I said, wow, what a, what a great question. And it's, you know, sometimes when you write books, you kind of move on to the next project and you're not sort of thinking about some of these issues, but it, but that sort of jarred something that was, you know, always in the back of my mind. And, and the other issue with the 1927 flood was, um, you know, going back to my uh, earlier comment about sources and um, sort of how we think about this, um, you know, so much of the 1927 flood in, in scholarship, including my own, really focuses mostly on Mississippi um, and, and Louisiana, right? And, and I said that my book was going to be different from John Barry's wonderful book and Pete Daniels' book, but then I ended up doing the same thing. You know, why? Because, you know, so much of the power of the story um, comes through the Mississippi Delta. Um, but also, you know, so much of the archives, you know, comes through, um, shines through the Mississippi Delta. Um, but, but I do think um, that my book and, and how I conceptualized it um, from the very beginning was, was, was a di diasporic book. In other words, I, 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 from the very beginning, thought about what the 1927 flood told us about migration to Chicago, what it told us about charity. So there was this, so what I argued was a flood diaspora sort of emanating from the 1927 flood. So that when African-Americans um, refused to give money to the American Red Cross because of um, the, the Red Cross's um, discriminatory practices, there was a network of people um, who, maneuver, who maneuvered around the American Red Cross in Chicago, in Baltimore, in New York City, so that um, the, the, the flood impacted you know, a large segment of people, some of which had never set foot in the Mississippi Delta. So in, in that sense, the 1927 flood was not just about what occurred in Mississippi, but it's also occurred, it's also about what occurs in, in, in Louisiana, I'm sorry, in certain parts of the North and certain parts of the West, um, because of this broader awareness of, of the situation that African Americans in the Mississippi Delta found themselves in. Um, so when you're talking about commemorating a disaster, it, it's not as easy to, to sort of pinpoint that, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. Um, but that, does, that doesn't mean that that is not an important part of the narrative, an important part of, of the story. And, and that's part of, you know, sort of how I think about the, the 1927 flood as well. Um, as far as my, my new book, um, 
I, I make a similar argument and, and you can, and, and this comes from my research and, 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 and sort of evaluation of the 1927 flood that so much of American history can be viewed through the lens of the 1927 flood. I sometimes think that the connection is a little bit overblown when people make so many connections between Katrina and the 1927 flood. Um, the levee systems were, were, there was this clear link between the levees in 1927 and, and Hurricane Katrina, but there are also some differences as well. You know, as Craig Colton, I think rightly argues, uh, much of the, the levee system around Katrina, um, you know, during 2005 was, was much more a result of what happened after Hurricane Betsy than the 1927 flood. And I think he's correct on that. But there are sort of some clear, you know, lineages as well. But for my diabetes book, um, and this answers the, the, the question as well, I do think that diabetes narrates the entirety of the 20th century. So there is not a single component of the 20th century that diabetes does not have an impact from immigration at the turn of the 20th century to the progressive era, um, to the Great Depression, New Deal, uh, World War I, World War II, civil rights, black power, post-civil rights, diabetes, diabetes narrates all of it. And in some ways, if you look closely, um, disasters can narrate large portions of American history well beyond its individual time frame, And I think that is part of the arguments that I make. Um, that's part of the argument that I make with the 1927 flood and with my um, new book on, on diabetes. Uh, Declan, go ahead. Can you hear me? All good? Yeah, yeah cool. Um, so I'm really kind of interested in this, in kind of the historical um, understanding and, and research on disasters. And I'm wondering um, from how we look at these to sort of center the perspective of the marginalized people that a lot of times were affected most by them. How do we do that in cases where these people, you know, did not have access a lot of times to writing and in the historical documents um, and writings done at the time period about certain disasters very much would, would center kind of the ruling white um, rich population. How do we kind of, I'm sure like oral history and other aspects of history are important in kind of understanding these, but I'm wondering how we, in our research and in understanding disasters from time periods ago where we really do not have that many written records, how we kind of work to understand them a little bit better um, because we do have sort of a lack of at least written documentation? Yeah, that's a good question. And in some ways, that's why I turned to, to the blues. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I think that the blues were such an important source for me because again, these were individuals who were, were there. And when I was you know, sort of, much more on the circuit for, for talking about this book, people used to, to always ask me where, well, were these blues musicians there? You know, did they personally experience the 1927 flood? And, and my response was mostly no. Um, I, I think Alice Pearson, um, who wrote a song on the, published a song on the 1927 flood, recorded a song rather, um, might've been there and Charlie Patton might've been there for certain parts of the flood, but, but most of them had already migrated to, um, to Chicago and Los Angeles and these songs were recorded in the 1930s. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this type of research and I have a penchant for choosing topics in which there are a, a dearth of sources, um, I think you have to become interdisciplinary. I think you have to use sources that um, other scholars do not necessarily think about and, and, and use theory to, to sort of think about, you know, ways in which you can employ um, various aspects of, 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 you know, whatever topic you're, you're researching. So blues music, um, historical fiction, um, poems, cartoons, um, you know, other types of folklore, you know, all of these things can, can, can be available to you in the absence of, of what we call um, traditional sources. And it's, it's, you know, I, 
I, I pride myself in a certain sense of sort of, you know, thinking outside the box when it comes to, to, to source materials, because, you know, when you're talking about African-Americans in the early part of the 20th century in particular, you're talking about a group who in some ways is, is less easy to track down than even um, enslaved populations of the 19th century. Um, slave populations of the 19th century, you know, might be um, um, sort of written about um, for, for, for certain reasons, but, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, many of these populations were, were just in, invisible. And so um, it's important to, to think about uh, various ways of knowing, and, and that's the term I would use, um, ways of knowing to, to sort of um, create um, arguments and suggestions about the historical past, but also look for, for, for bodies of knowledge that, that other scholars have, have ignored unnecessarily so. Um, as, as one example, I'll, 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 I'll tell you in closing, I'm shocked at the um, lack of use of black insurance company records for um, people who are doing research in, on, on African Americans race and disease in the early part of the 20th century. Um, United um, Black Insurance Company in, in New York City, North Carolina Mutual, um, in um, North Carolina, Golden State in Los Angeles. These are, for me, have been treasure troves. And when I say treasure troves, I don't mean that there's like bodies of, you know, archives and, you know, documents all over the place, but all you need is, 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 a, is a nugget. You know, if you go to, if you're in an archive for six days and on the seventh day, you find one document that completely transforms your chapter, to me, that's a worthwhile um, engagement. And so, you know, thinking about all of these other um, bodies of knowledge that scholars have unnecessarily ignored, I think can help you significantly along the way for, for thinking about these questions for, um, for the historical past. Thanks, I, I am especially appreciative of that answer because um, as someone who went to graduate school in Durham under the, the shadow of the NC Mutual building, I'm really excited to hear someone using uh, insurance company records like that, uh, not just for the history of the insurance companies, which is I feel like how we usually hear about NC Mutual. And so I'm really excited to hear you use it for, um, uh, uh, for medical history that, or history of health. That is- um, No, really absolutely, cool. absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, those are great documents. And that, that, that's kind of where I was, I was on the trail for a lot more of those insurance records before the pandemic hit in Atlanta. And uh, whenever I can get back to the archive, that's the first place I'm going. So. Mm -hmm. Well, so um, unless someone has uh, another, another question, um, I'm going to I will pause in my sentence to give someone a chance to raise their hand. But I want to thank you, uh, Richard Mizell, for a really uh, thought-provoking, um, an interesting talk. It, it has actually it had really provoked some um, some new ideas for me about these questions of temporality and and um, what historians bring to questions of disaster research and disaster scholarship. And actually, with that, I'm going to. Uh, pitch um, for, for, uh, for you and for those in the audience um, that I, as part of the um, Initiative for Critical Disaster Studies, I and a, a group of other historians have been publishing uh, this year a series of working papers on historical approaches to COVID-19. Uh, you can find it at our website, uh, which is wp.nyu.edu slash disasters. Um, and that uh, the, our goal with with that project was to was to demonstrate way different ways that historians could um, could engage with with disaster with disaster research. Um, and I, ho I hope we have done a good job of kind of, and, and there are more coming out of, of demonstrating how different forms of historical analysis, and different forms of historical question making can then rate can be useful in different ways. So there's history by analogy, there's history by narration, there's questions about oral history and exclusion from archives. Um, there's um, there's history just sort of raising new questions for us to think about about contemporary questions. And I think what you've done here, uh, Rick, is to actually also to show several ways 
of that history can can be brought to bear on contemporary and near contemporary questions. So I really want to thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. That was a, a, a really fantastic way of, of ending this series. So thank you. Thank you to everyone in the unseen uh, audience for, for spending your, your the beginning part of your Friday afternoon with us. Um, thanks. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.